very much, Lauren. As Lauren was saying, uh, these, this REN webinar series is now being hosted by the American Wind Wildlife Institute, so thank you for all your efforts, Lauren. And thank you all for joining us for the 11th webinar in the REN webinar series. And for those who may not know, REN is the name for the International Energy Agency Wind Task 34, which consists of 10 member nations. And REN stands for Working Together to Resolve Environmental Effects of Wind Energy. We launched this webinar series in 2014. Uh, we hold them quarterly, uh, and we developed it to support REN's goals of facilitating international collaboration that advances global understanding of the environmental effects of wind energy development. Today's web, uh, REN webinar covers it's, it's the second of a two-part series on offshore wind environmental programs, and this particular webinar will cover Vattenfall's environmental research program at the European Offshore Wind Deployment Center, as well as the Dutch Offshore Wind Ecological Program. So each REN webinar offers perspectives from multiple nations on research monitoring methodologies and the results of wind energy and wildlife interactions. All webinars are housed on our REN hub, and you see the URL here at the bottom, uh, tethys.pnnl.gov. So the REN hub holds all the information on previous webinars as well as all products being developed by the REN member team. So today uh, is part two, as I said. Part one was held in March 2017, where Dr. John King from the University of Rhode Island covered the, uh, the university, sorry, the Un United States Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM's real-time opportunity for development of environmental observations, the rodeo study at the U.S.'s first offshore wind farm on, off of Block Island. Today is part two where we're going to cover two other international programs. Jesper Kayed Larsen from Vattenfall Wind in Denmark will, will speak first, and Jesper, has a uh, master's in biology, water, waterfowl ecology from Aarhus University in Denmark. And Vattenfall is a major European utility uh, that he's been with for the last 10 years. He's filling the role right now of team lead for a small group of environmental experts working to build and apply the evidence base for impacts of wind farm development on biological interests, including the mit mitigation. Following Jesper's presentation, Ingeborg von Slender a project leader for the Dutch Offshore Wind Ecological Program will then present on her project a little bit about Ingeborg. She studied biology and got her PhD in 1998 on the development of floodplain forests along large rivers. She works at Rick Waterstadt since 1991, and she's worked many years in the field of biological monitoring of the main waters in the Netherlands, including the North Sea. She's been project leader of WOZEP, which she'll talk about uh, since 2015. And the WOZEP project team is a group of experts from Rick Waterstadt who define the research projects. WOZEP is an assignment from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So thank you, Ingeborg and Jesper, for uh, presenting today. And I'll turn it over to you, Ingeborg. Um, thank you, Elise, for uh, introducing me. Um, I will now tell you about uh, the project WOZEP, the Offshore Wind Energy Ecological Program. It's a very large research program that was started in uh, 2016. Um, just go to the next slide this way. Yeah, the content of the, this webinar, this presentation I will give. I will tell you about the WOZEP project, but I first go to the previous research um, and the implementation of this research in um, the mitigation, mitigating measures, for instance. Uh, then I will tell you about uh, the VOSA pro program. Um, I'll tell more about the goals, where the research is focused on, and the research program, what we're going to do. And I'll tell you about the research on the birds, bats, marine mammals, and underwater noise. Uh, we will going to do the, pre uh, the next coming years. Um, 
But first we go back, where did it start? Uh, the main uh, effects of wind farms at sea uh, are underwater noise, uh, the effects on marine mammals, and above the water you have mainly collisions collisions with birds, but also with bats, we found. Another thing is that the habitat changes because of the presence of the wind farms. So what is the effect of the, uh, the change of the habitat? Uh, we have little knowledge. And um, if you look at the environmental impact assessment or the appropriate assessment, that um, you have to work with the knowledge that's there. And if there's little knowledge, you have to make a lot of assumptions. Um, and we have to deal with the ecological boundaries that there are in order to have wind farms uh, offshore. So um, uh, where was the research started in the Netherlands? Uh, that started with um, from these uh, assumptions in the uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, and it was part of the permit that the, wind, uh, the energy um, sector got that you get a permit, but then you also have to research what the effects are. So in the future, we have more knowledge uh, and to uh, have a better idea what the impact of the wind farms are. So the first research started from the parks we have here, and the parks are the names that are written down. Um, and next to that, the government also started research on the ecological effects. So that is where the research uh, came from and what was the topic of the research. It was, for one thing, the piling, so the underwater impact. Piling, we, we studied uh, the effect of underwater noise on fish larvae, uh, what is the impact on the fish. But the effects were smaller than expected, so we closed that uh, topic uh, because it was not a significant effect. Um, we did research in basins with the harbor poipoids and uh, with seals, and um, we could just measure uh, experimental uh, way uh, that the area of disturbance from the re uh, from the source of the piling was 15 kilometers um, on the at the bottom and five uh, uh, one meter below uh, the surface for seals at the harbor point because it was even 27 kilometers. So much better uh, facts were uh, drawn from this research. Uh, we also did um, research on um, you know, how the, the disturbing was of the feeding, the communication and reproduction, and on hearing damage. So this was you know, where the, the uh, research was focused on with underwater effects. Um, and if you look at the effects above water, it's the collisions that we saw, uh, that there are uh, collision risk for seabirds, uh, migrating birds, and coastal breeding birds. Uh, and there are significant effects on larger gulls especially. And you have, if you look at the birds at sea, you have, well, um, two, two types. Uh, there are birds that have a collision risk, and there are birds, other species that um, uh, avoid the, the wind farms. So um, these are two types of reactions. Um, another species that collides with uh, the turbines uh, might be the bats. Uh, we have done in the, the first research uh, that we, we, we found the presence of bats on platforms um, and at sea, and so we saw that there is a migration of this species, uh, Natusius pipistrelle, uh, and it migrates from uh, the Dutch coast to uh, the United Kingdom. And this was rather new for us, but we saw that there's a potential risk for this species. Um, we also knew that bats were killed onshore, so this was enough to see that this is uh, an, a priority topic to do research on. Um, how did we use this, uh, these first results? We used it uh, to get an idea of the cumulative effect. So if you have one wind farm, the effect is, well, there is an effect. But if you uh, look in the perspective of the Southern North Sea, you have the wind farms that are present at the moment and the wind farms that are present in the plants for the coming years. And you have the wind farms from uh, the countries that are uh, 
uh, next to you. So what is the cumulative effect of all these wind farms and plants on bats and birds and uh, marine mammals? So we made a framework to do the assessment of the cumulative effects. Um, so, um, and we saw what the effects were. Um, you have to decide how to, uh, what, what, uh, uh, to choose the, uh, what the impact is, what the acceptable impact is, and we choose for the potential biological removal. So how much of the population can be removed uh, and what is accepted for that, that it has no uh, impact on the population. And we have had little data for that, but with the expert judgment and the results we had, we could see that from unmitigated noise, um, the PBR was exceeded, so this was a significant uh, impact. Uh, for habitat loss, at that moment, it was not um, significant um, with the plans up to 2023, but if you look in the future, this might be a much bigger problem. Um, barrier effects were not likely. Um, for the larger goals, the PBR was exceeded, so for larger goals, it is uh, the ecological boundaries will be met uh, if you continue with the uh, wind farms offshore. Uh, for other bird species, um, the PBR was not yet met, but you can see that this, uh, it, it, it will be a problem in the future. And altogether, from this exercise, you could see that there are um, knowledge gaps, um, and we needed to fill them to have a better idea of the cumulative effects. Um, how is this used? Next slide. Yeah. And this information used in the permits for the, the wind farms, the, the offshore wind farms, what mitigation measures uh, had to be uh, followed. Um, one of it was that uh, if you take bigger turbines, you have fewer turbines and they're further away from each other and that has less impact. Um, you have to have a seri serious attempt in your uh, wind farm to enhance a healthy marine environment. Uh, you have to have acoustic deterring devices uh, and a low piling energy at the start of the pile driving. And there is a maximum, a, a boundary of noise level on the water while piling driving. Uh, another mitigation measure was uh, to stop the rotors during mouth bird migration peaks and also uh, with the migration of the bats, but that's more um, you start later with the turning of the rotor blades because the bat migration is uh, at very low wind speed. So if you start with a little higher wind speed uh, to turn the rotors, then that's the mitigating measure. Um, and another mitigation measure is that there's cooperation from the wind sector um, with monitoring and evaluation it had to be um, supportive to that. And that's very important, of course, to make this research possible. Um, so that was the past, and now we go to the start of WOSEP. Eh? We had research, we had all kinds of significant effects, or maybe significance, uh, and we see um, species at risk. So um, where we, uh, that's the starting point of, of WOSEP. And we have to improve the knowledge um, from the perspective of environmental impact assessment. You have to evaluate and increase the knowledge to do it better in the future. Um, and we um, have knowledge gaps and assumptions uh, where the research will be focused on. Um, if you have one overall research program, you can work much more efficient and focus on uh, um, relay, um, um, the topics that are more import most important. And um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs realized this and saw, well, we have one main pro uh, program for research instead of having different smaller research programs that the energy sector um, executes. So we have one general program called VOSEP and the Alskrex Waterstaat to execute that. So that's the start of the VOSEP. Another thing is that there's a new policy on wind energy. There's a new energy agenda 
in the Netherlands and that has plans for um, maybe an increase of more than one gigabyte each year. So there will be more wind farms offshore and the effects will increase. So we need the knowledge at this moment to advise better and to see better where you, um, yeah, where the, the space for wind farms at sea will be. Um, what are the goals of WOSEP? I told already a bit about it, so it's the knowledge gaps and assumptions. The upscaling become more and more important, uh, but also what is the effectiveness of mitigation measures? Um, are these the measures to be taken and how um, effective are they? So that is where the research will give input form. What is the general approach of the research? We mainly research cause-effect relation. Do we understand uh, what the impact of the offshore wind parks are? Uh, and then we apply the knowledge. But these are direct effects, but also indirect effects. So if the habitat changes, um, uh, and then what effect does that have on the species that are affected by the windmills? So if there's more uh, f um, fish and other uh, feeding components for birds or for marine mammals. Um, that also has an effect uh, on the whole um, ecosystem. So that's part of the, the research of the, the, the general approach. Uh, we will work with models. Yeah, now we can study the effects, but if you have a model, you can also translate it to future scenarios if you have more wind farms or other kind of wind uh, turbines. Um, so we have uh, some research on the uh, model development. Um, mainly we research the, the most sensitive species and that are close to the PBR, uh, that are the large gulls, the bats, the harbor poipoi, common guillemots. There are more species, but these are the main species we will research. What have we done so far? In 2016, it was um, pilots, uh, feasibility studies. I will show you some results uh, in the next slides, and they will be in green, the results we already have, and the rest is what our intentions are, uh, what we will, con we will do. Uh, we have, um, well, we had time uh, to knowledge, to need, formulate the good questions for the research and um, to write that down in the program um, for the coming years, um, we want to have connection with the stakeholders and the contractors to see how we can work together the coming years and um, prepare the tenders. So that's up to so far. Um, I will show you now in some slides the research itself we're going to do. And as I said, in green is the region what we have done last year. Um, for instance, that on, on the subject of marine mammals and underwater noise, it is the validation of the underwater, on, underwater noise. Um, we have improved that, uh, the modeling, um, and we have made uh, a distribution map uh, of the seals, the harvest seals, using tag data and census data. Um, and before that, there were little data to make a good distribution maps, and now we had enough data to make a map. I'll show you it on the next slide. Uh, we've also done an analysis of husbandry data uh, of the harbor porpoise. We want to do energetic studies, so the effect of piling on harbor porpoise can have an effect. Uh, it will be disturbed so it can't feed anymore, so there's some starvation. Uh, and what will that eventually be the effect on the harbor poipers and the reproduction, et cetera. And if you want to do an energetic study, you have to have basic data on the weight and the, the blubber uh, thickness of the porpoise during the year uh, through the seasons. So we have done that start, uh, as a start of the energetic study. We've also looked at the contaminants in the, uh, the harbor poipers. It's, it's a rather sensitive um, species. And next to the effects of windmills, you have already a stress from the contaminants that are present in the North Sea. So we want to see how this um, 
is in perspective of each other. So there's been some study to contaminants. What we're going to do, what we're going to start, is uh, that we're going to improve the propagation model. Uh, this, what is the, the noise propagation? Um, to see if frequency weighting is important in that model. Um, and we also look at the sensitivity of seals. At the moment, it is uh, an assumption that the harbor porpoise is the most sensitive species. So if you follow that species, um, well, it might be good for seals too, but maybe that's not the case. So we're looking into that in more detail and have, yeah, we could have more um, focus on the seals in the future research too. Another thing is that we're going to um, look at does the noise have eventually an effect on the population of uh, the marine mammals in the, the southern uh, North Sea, so the harbor porpoise and the seals. And you can have an effect on an individual, but what is important for uh, ecological boundaries is does it have an effect on the population? So we will translate that and do work on modeling, etc. Um, what we need, therefore, is the distribution and the behavior of the harbor porpoise, and we want to do research using tagging. Um, but we first want to do a thorough study of the feasibility of this tagging in the Dutch context. So um, does it fit into the Dutch rules and is there support from stakeholders? Because it is um, a lot of discussion on this research, so we have to be very thorough in that. So that is the things we're going to do on marine mammals and underwater noise the coming years. Um, the next one is, oh yeah, the, the, the picture of the distribution of the harbor seals I wanted to show you. So you can see, especially in the north of the Netherlands, the most seals uh, and the further away from the coast you see less seals, but this gives a good basis to work from. Um, bird collisions, what are the ideas for the coming years? What have we done so far? You need instrument to measure collisions or to measure flux. And we have done a research on what are the instruments at the moment, what is the best way to collect data. So that was one of the pilots. Um, for the risk of collisions we used in the Netherlands, we used the BAMT model. Um, and what we're trying to do is to improve the input for the model. Um, so the first thing we did is we tracked some new, we found new GPS data in other countries uh, and uh, used that and saw what that, uh, what the output improved. Um, and this is what we continue to do, yeah, to, to have better data on fluxes for birds, to have more data on behavior uh, and more data on collisions itself. So that's the data input we're going to collect the coming years. And maybe uh, there's also a need to look at the bound model itself. Uh, we, we were not sure about that yet, but um, well, that's two ways. You have the input and you have the model itself. So uh, we will look at that uh, maybe in the coming years. Um, something we also started is the tagging of birds. And the measuring of the height is done by the GPS. So we try to improve this instrument, this GPS tagging um, in order to uh, tag the large goals and to see what their behavior is in the parks. Um, and the final bullet here is population modeling of the five most vulnerable bird species. That is, for now, if you have the population development, uh, it's the the reproduction and the death, and now an increased mortality due to uh, risk of collisions. And if you have different uh, scenarios of how where the wind farms will be in in the North Sea the coming years, uh, you have more and more uh, risk on collision, probably, especially for um, uh, specific species. And we're going to develop these uh, models uh, the coming years. So we start with that this year. The habitat loss is um, an increasing issue, problem, um, likely. 
um, if we looked at the, uh, the cumulative effect assessment, this was taken into account, but it was completely based on assumptions. So we have to uh, do research to get some real knowledge and facts about this um, topic. And what we did this year was we had an international workshop uh, where we uh, used data of several countries and to do together a statistic analysis to see if the distribution of the common guillemots in and outside wind farms differs. And it's not yet finalized yet, but we saw uh, the first result that there is a difference in distribution. So in fact, you could say, well, there is a displacement issue. Um, another thing is we're going to do this year is to start um, a pilot on a behavioral study of the common gallimates in a wind park. How do they behave? Do they avoid it or not? And is it possible to do those, um, uh, this study from a wind park uh, just to sit there and to watch the birds? Is that a, is that a way, a method to, to collect this data? But we'll start this, um, this year. Um, further on, we also do uh, the modeling, um, but for this uh, habitat loss, you base it on an habitat model and you combine it with a population model. So you have an expectation based on the habitat um, uh, specifications and um, you couple it to what the effect on the population with the presence of wind farms will be. Um, we mainly, we try to do that on the information that is already present. There's a lot of information on birds on the North Sea is there from the Netherlands, but also from other countries. So we try to use that um, best. But if uh, new fieldwork is necessary, we will do new fieldwork. Uh, the main species we will be focusing on um, are written into this slide. So that is the focus, we start on this, um, well, the coming month, and it will um, take some years to finish it. The bat research, um, there's little known about bats. It is recognized that it might be a real problem, huh? that it has an impact, impact on the population, but we have to know uh, much more about these bats. We have to know about their population size. We have to know they come from the Baltic states and they um, pass Holland and migrate to the United Kingdom, but also go more south. So what is the population and how, what percentage of the population migrates and how important is that for the total population? So we've done some research on and the, the modeling approach to estimate population, we have some first results on that, and there's not much data, but um, it is a good way to get an idea of the population. Um, furthermore, we have done research with bat detectors just to see where are the, uh, how, met, how many bats do we find along the coast and at the, the North Sea. Uh, we continue this work. We have done research on that, but we have to get more data on that. So we continue the bat detector research. Uh, another research is uh, tagging the um, migratory bats huh, with telemetry. Um, we start with it this year with very little tags, small tags. I mean, um, we try to, to tag them and to follow them to see uh, what the migrating routes are. Um, and what we... Yeah, we want to start, and uh, this is in the beginning yet, is to, to, to see, to look at the, the behavior of the bats around the turbines and the risk of collisions. Uh, we, we want to do that for thermal imaging cameras, and it's innovative work. We started with that. It is, we see the possibilities, and we want to uh, uh, go on with this research the coming years. This is a map of where the bat detectors were in 2016. You just have an idea how many stations are there and how far on the North Sea we have our stations. And we will prolong this um, bat detector research. 
Um, the species I, I, I told you about, the, the collisions with the bats and the birds and the underwater noise and the marine mammals are the priority species, but we also have tension of what changes in the habitat in the wind farm. So we've done Bantos research. Um, what is happening in the wind farms in the Netherlands is that there's no uh, bottom trail fishing anymore, so the substrate is much less disturbed than uh, when there were no wind farms. So we have data sets, we have done surveys the last 10 years in two wind farms, and we can make a comparison of the development of the benzos in the soft substrate inside and outside the wind farms. Uh, we have done a survey uh, in March this year, and we are analyzing the results at the moment. So then we can see over a longer period of time, what is the benzos um, development. Um, yeah, another topic we have is electromagnetic fields. That is, um, there are a lot of transport ca cables in the North Sea, and there are um, electromagnetic fields around those transport uh, cables. And since they're coming more and more wind farms, this might become a bigger issue. So we research it. It's, so is it? What kind of impact will it have? Can you measure it? Is there really uh, a magnetic field, and what is the effect on, for instance, sharks and rays or other fish? Um, is it an effect on the behavior, yeah, on the navigation, on the communication, um, and how negative is the effect, and eventually does it have an effect on the uh, population? But at the moment, we just are at the beginning of the research and want to see can we measure electromagnetic fields in the North Sea? And maybe in an experimental way, can we see changes in behavior of um, uh, sensitive species? So we will definitely do some work on this in the beginning of WOSEP, and we'll see how important this uh, will be. Um, something else that is very important for us, that is not the research on the ecological species, but um, to have a good professional proper data management uh, from the Dutch government, it's, um, we have to have an open data policy. So if you have data, you can, must share them with the rest of the community for reuse. Um, we will do that. but. On the other side, we think it's very important to have a good data management for transparency and reproducibility of our results um, as a good quality insurance. Um, we are also a pilot project in the AMOTnet uh, where uh, ecological data uh, on effect studies of wind farms are chosen as a pilot to, be, to get more data um, um, available for everyone to use via the EMODnet, uh, and we are pilots in that. So the VOSA project will um, give the data in time uh, in this EMODnet pilot. Um, during the pilot, uh, the data during the project of VOSA, the data will be only for the project, but afterwards, if the results are approved, etc., and then it will be open for public use. And so this is also a goal of this project, to have open data use and share of knowledge. Um, well, I come to the, 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 the end of the, the presentation um, with some final remarks. And um, as I've stressed already, we are very much uh, want to stimulate the open use of data and knowledge. Um, and want to uh, we uh, to to increase we want to increase the international cooperation between especially countries around the North Sea uh, to exchange knowledge on the species, but also on the use of models or improvement of models. That if we use similar uh, methods, then things are much better comparable. That will eventually lead to a better assessment of cumulative effects. Um, so that is 
yeah, what we want to do. And so if you have any uh, ideas or um, things you want to share, uh, please contact us because we're very uh, happy with um, um, these relations or these ideas. Um, yeah, if you have questions afterwards, I have put my email in there so you can contact me. And I have told you the general program, but there's a whole team of specialists that are um, for the actual research on the birds and the bats, etc. Uh, I can couple link you to these people if you have specific questions. We also have a website in English and the most important documents of our research program you can find over there. Uh, the research program itself but also results of former research uh, you can find uh, the documents over there. Um, well, thank you for listening. This was uh, the presentation I wanted to give. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, for questions, please type your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and that will send it over to us to read out loud. Uh, have alternatives to PBR been considered or used to validate the conclusions reached using PBR? Yeah, and that is a very actual uh, um, question because, um, well, just to answer the question, we have not done that yet, but in the research we will considerately consider it. There have been reports that uh, evaluate the use of PBR and is it the best way of um, yeah, to use the, the, the PBR or not, and we are aware of that, and we take it into account and try to come to the best um, yeah, describing of the impact. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here. Have you considered any acoustic or video monitoring for detecting collisions? Um, yes. Um, it's a bit specialized question for me. That's more the specialist in my team who can answer that immediately. Uh, but what we are working on, um, uh, we have done some research on an, a combination of uh, radar images and, um, well, I'm sorry, I think I, I can't uh, specify enough, uh, tell you enough about how we've done that, but there has been um, measuring of collisions and the way it's done is too specialized for me. But we have done that and we try to uh, continue that kind of research in the future to actually um, um, measure the collisions. And I've seen pictures of uh, an actual collision with a bird. Okay, thank you. And one more question here. Uh, which bat species have you tagged with radio tags? Um, well, as I uh, showed you that the Natusius pipistrella, that's the species we will research. Um, and um, we have to start with the tagging. Yeah. And I think there are two more species that are also, that are also going to be tagged, but we are yeah, elaborating the, the, the research right now, so that's for the coming month to uh, make more specific. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions, so I think we can move on to our next speaker. Uh, Jesper, are you still with us? I am. Great. I am pulling up your presentation here. And you can take it away. Thank you for that. Hello, uh, everyone. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to present the EOWDC research program on this webinar. And thanks for the sponsors and organizers of this webinar series for this great effort to facilitate international collaboration and knowledge exchange, which is obviously very important and, and much is to be gained there. I am going to give you a quick and fairly high level introduction to the EUWC 
environmental research program and the first project commissioned under that program. The program is that with uh, Vattenfall, uh, a major European utility and among the leaders in offshore wind development in Europe. I am myself from Vattenfall and uh, my role in the program is to keep an eye on the science and the applied value. The European Offshore Wind Deployment Center, uh, EOWDC, is a test and demonstration facility uh, close to Aberdeen off the coast of eastern Scotland. You might be able to see a red uh, dot on the big map, uh, and on the inserted maps you can see uh, the location of uh, and layout of the wind farm close to the coast. The EOWC is supported by uh, an EU grant and set to deliver technical innovation and scientific research to improve the competitiveness of uh, offshore wind energy production, generating environmentally sound uh, marketable electricity. And should it increase supply chain capabilities in, in Scotland and beyond, uh, that wouldn't hurt either. Some of the major innovative aspects on the technical side uh, worth mentioning uh, here is the use of uh, the world's currently most powerful wind turbines, um, a SS 8.4 megawatt uh, turbine, uh, which will be placed on uh, suction bucket jacket uh, foundations and uh, using a 66 kilovolt uh, cabling. And then, of course, there's the interesting really interesting part for this context and the focus of this presentation, uh, the scientific research program. The scientific research program was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was established to improve the understanding of the environmental impacts of offshore wind, recognizing the importance of a good evidence base for planning and contenting, facilitating and environmentally sustainable growth of uh, this industry in the end. Uh, a fund of 3 million euros, uh, of which uh, Martin Fall uh, provides at least half, uh, was set aside for this purpose. The program was established in close discussion with the Scottish ministers, ministers uh, who also guided on the appointment of a scientific panel with representatives from all major stakeholders uh, in a Scottish context, including governments, statutory advisory bodies, NGOs, and industry groups. Chaired by Professor Stuart Kipp from uh, the University of Highlands and Islands in Scotland, uh, using a so-called multi-criterion decision analysis approach, the panel defined the focus areas and priorities of the program. Uh, leading to uh, eight uh, themes being identified with uh, focus areas within each of these uh, themes uh, listed. And the themes are shown here in, in decreasing order of priority. In addition to this, the panel played a key role in reviewing the project proposals. Um, and having an agreed list of preferred projects from the panel did make uh, our life uh, a lot easier uh, in uh, choosing the uh, projects to take forward. Just to try and give you a, a graphical overview of uh, the process and timeline. The program was set out as part of the application uh, for the wind farm and uh, anchored in the content for the EOWC in March 2013. Uh, then we were busy with uh, other stuff for a few years, uh, thanks to among us a certain gentleman who weren't exactly taken by the thought of having a wind farm uh, in his view. Um, 
past that the panel was uh, revived in March uh, last year, 2016, uh, and the call for expressions of interest uh, interest was uh, launched in August 16. We were extremely happy with uh, uh, the massive interest in the call. We received uh, almost 100 uh, proposals uh, covering all the research, research uh, themes and coming from uh, across uh, Europe and uh, the States. Following a, a rigorous review and discussion with the panel, a short list of 16, 16 projects were uh, agreed and invited to uh, put forward detailed proposals, which were uh, in turn uh, uh, scrutinized in detail and scored on a number of uh, parameters together with the panel leading to a list of prioritized uh, projects uh, from which we uh, uh, did uh, our best uh, to extract what we considered uh, within the scope and the budget available, the, the best uh, suit of uh, and most promising suit of projects to take forward. Jesper, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we had a request. If you're able to speak a little bit louder or get closer to your phone. Okay. Thanks. I will try so. Thanks. Um, finally, last week, we uh, finalized the contracts for four of these uh, projects. And I'm very happy to be able to talk about them today. Uh, they were uh, just only made uh, public uh, this afternoon. So, I guess it's it's uh, almost a kind of breaking news. Uh, we are still in discussion with the two other projects and uh, hope to clarify whether we will be able to take these forward within uh, the coming months. As you will see, it's uh, a rather diverse set of projects. The first four projects uh, spanning the four themes considered of highest importance to target with the research effort of uh, this program. All, uh, I'm happy to say, sat with very strong uh, research groups representing some of the most forefront expertise within the respective fields. And I will go through each of them uh, shortly now over the next four slides. The first one. Uh, it's about building a baseline knowledge about migration routes and wintering areas for orcs, uh, the common guillemot and uh, the razor bill, uh, both uh, breeding in Scotland. This is two species that are considered vulnerable to displacement uh, by offshore wind farms, as uh, Ingebus was also um, uh, referring to, uh, and for which the UK holds uh, international uh, internationally important breeding populations. Geolocated tanks will, will be deployed on uh, 200 kilowatts and 150 razor bills uh, this year and again in 2018 uh, across seven uh, different Scottish uh, colonies. The project is led by MacArthur Green working uh, with the Center of Ecology and Hydrology, uh, CEH. Uh, it includes a PhD studentship and is set to deliver in 2021. The second project is about building a better understanding of the movements of bottlenose dolphins up and down the Scottish east coast, complementing work going on in the northern part of the range of this population. The method used will be photo identification from boats conducted over a period of two years. Being a population that has been studied by PhotoID for more than 20 years, an extensive database uh, uh, with information on individuals is available, making it possible for this work to produce important new knowledge on the population biology uh, as well. The work is led by Smooth Consulting working closely with the Sea Mammal Research Unit at the University of St. Andrews. And the project is set to deliver in 2020.
the third project is uh, addressing a need to better understand the pathways salmon and sea trout takes away from the rivers. The three Scottish East Coast rivers, Dee, Don, and Iceland, all have salmon and sea trout fisheries of economic importance. And these rivers will be the focus of this research. The method used will be fitting juvenile fish, 300 salmon and 100 sea trout, with acoustic tags and recording their passage of uh, receiver arrays of the coast. Information on movements, uh, dispersal, and knowledge of currents will be fed into an existing hydrodynamic model developed by Marine Scotland Science, the Scottish Shelf Model, to determine the pathways uh, and what uh, influences this. The project is conducted by the River D Trust in cooperation with Marine Scotland Science and is set to deliver in 2020. The last of the four projects commissioned so far is aiming to address uh, a need to, to have a stronger evidence base on the impacts on the economy and the communities near to offshore wind farms. The project will involve reviewing exist, existing methods for predicting socioeconomic impacts using data from the EOWC and data available from other sites to validate these uh, methods. This will form the basis for identifying good practice impact assessment methods and best practice in maximizing uh, local economic benefits. The project will be conducted by Oxford Brookes University and will conclude in 2019. Um, I would like to, to end this presentation picking up some learnings uh, at this stage of the program. Having the scientific panel um, have been really indispensable uh, in securing the quality and applied uh, focus of the program. Uh, this is much recommended and has have been a great pleasure uh, uh, as well. Having the key stakeholders involved uh, with offshore wind development uh, planning and consenting in one room to discuss and align on research priorities is, is key to getting value for money in such a program, I think. Another point uh, I would want to highlight, which I think has been uh, very valuable for this program, is the perspective of having a scope that includes the possibility of uh, including projects focus on uh, building the baseline knowledge on key species rather than focusing on effect studies. Three of the four projects initiated so far uh, fall into this category. In the case of the EUWC, the size and location of the wind farm left it uh, difficult and less likely to deliver solid and represents uh, results on effects for, for a number of issues. And it was considered that uh, directing the efforts into um, improving the, the, the baseline information for these species would be uh, in itself a very valuable contribution to uh, future also wind farm uh, as, uh, assessments. And then, uh, probably unsurprisingly, time and resources needed to establish uh, uh, such a program uh, were uh, quite underestimated uh, on, uh, on uh, our part. Uh, a posit positive problem uh, to some degree, of course, because it uh, sort of was also a result of the fact that we had so much interest uh, uh, in the program. And of course, we needed to, to pay respect to uh, uh, the, the applicants uh, uh, having put effort into the proposal and hopes into it as well. So we needed to, to put a, a, a serious amount of time into considering their proposals uh, in an orderly manner.
Jeg tænkte, at EOWC, Scientific Research Program, Up and Running, and to a stage now where concrete projects uh, can be started, have involved a lot of dedicated effort from uh, a lot of people. First of all, uh, the scientific panel uh, chaired by Stuart Gibb uh, deserves a lot of credit and praise for their engagement. Uh, uncompensated, putting a lot of time and effort uh, into the program, always uh, constructive and positive. Um, you can see a list of the member organization uh, on this slide. Uh, from Vattenfall, uh, Edwin Slateholm and Helen Jameson were instrumental in uh, the conception and development of the program. Also, we have uh, had great support uh, from John Hartley and colleagues from Hartley Anderson and from Liz Masten from the University of Highlands and Islands in managing the program and uh, reviewing the proposals. And finally, um, I'm conscious this has been a rather high level account and I'm, I'm happy of course to take any questions. Uh, now to the extent time allows or, or after the uh, webinar. So please feel free to contact uh, myself or Hannah Hendren uh, on these email addresses and you might be able to find a bit more information as well on the project website. That was all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can, we'll now take questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We've had one come in so far that's for uh, both presenters, asking, in what ways are results from your programs being used to support the consenting process? Jesper, do you have any yes. responses? Okay, you want to go first? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, this has been a very clear focus in the review of our, the proposals we have had, that they uh, would be able to deliver uh, knowledge that would fit direct, directly into the uh, consenting and planning of offshore wind farms in terms of uh, managing uh, potential conflicts with environmental interests. So, so the applied aspect is, is very high in, in the projects we have chosen to take forward. So uh, when results are available, it's the expectation that they should be, it should be possible to feed them directly into uh, uh, the assessments of, of, of uh, new wind farm developments. Thank you. Uh, Ingborg, do you have any response to the question? Um, well, I think I've uh, showed in the slides already that what the former results meant for uh, mitigating measures, for instance. So you can see a direct use of the uh, information uh, to make um, wind farms possible, including the mitigation measures. And the new research program will improve the data. So um, the assessment um, will be done more accurate and will give, we, uh, it will give us more insight in the effect relations and uh, the, the type of mitigating measures you have to take. So, well, I agree with Jasper, there was a very uh, strong uh, short line from the results and the, the application of the results in the, the wind farm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I don't see any other questions coming in. So, oh, here's one. Um, it is clear that the results of the described research is intended for consideration of future offshore wind projects. Uh, but is there any intent to apply adaptive management to existing operating facilities based on the research results? I think that's probably not one for me to 
to answer. Just being a green thumb developer, not not a, mm -hmm. a regulator. Okay, Ingborg, any any thoughts on that question? Uh, well, um, research and and the the research results are input for adaptive management. That's the way we see it. Um, so yeah. That's an approach we're going to see how it works out in the coming years, how you can use it. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question came in for Jesper. Can you say anything about the budget for uh, the research and where the money is coming from? Yeah, yes. Uh, I can say something about the total budget, which is 3 million euros. And uh, at least half of that is uh, provided by Vattenfall uh, and the rest by the EU. So that's part okay. of the EU grant for this test and demonstration facility. Great, thank you. All right, not seeing any other questions, so I think Elise, I will pull up your closing slide and turn it to you. Thank you very much uh, to our two speakers, Ingeborg and Jesper. Those are uh, very informative webinars. And thank you, Lauren Flynn, for your, uh, your coordination of the webinar. Uh, if you, anybody has any questions, I uh, just refer you to three of our REN operating agents, Karen Sinclair from NREL. Andrea Copping from PNNL uh, Laboratory, and Jocelyn Brown Saracino from the Department of Energy. Uh, they'd be happy to uh, receive any uh, input and comments on this webinar series or REN in general. I uh, wanted to let everyone know that there is a webinar planned for September 20. Uh, we'll uh, send out information on this webinar. The topic is individual to population. Um, we have two speakers. One is Finley Bennett from Marine Scotland Science, and the second speaker will be from West Inc. here in the here in the U.S. Uh, the REN group did meet uh, just this last week in Sweden, and they discussed other topics. And I'm just going to list a few, just so that if anyone has any ideas or suggestions, uh, we really could uh, will take that anything you have into consideration. Some of the topics they discussed are. Uh, restoration of sites after decommissioning, uh, looking at cumulative impacts in repowering scenarios, impacts of roads and tracks, compensation, and also environmental management of wind in developing countries. Again, if anyone has suggestions and comments on topics you'd like to see in our webinar series, please let us know. And all, again, all uh, webinars are uh, captured and stored on our REN hub, and that's at TFIS pnnl.gov. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you on future webinars, and thank you very much.